Okay, so we're good to go. Yeah. All right, hi everyone. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, how to do epigenome-wide association studies or EWAS. Um, particularly, we're going to be working with DNA methylation analysis. Um, I'm Will Casaza. I'm a PhD candidate in the Dennis Lab, and I'm here with Amy Inkster. I think she can fit in the screen here too. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to reload this page. Yeah, and if everything messes up, I can always just take off the background. Um, so before we get into everything, we're going to acknowledge that we are on the land of the um, the Musqueam people. It's the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, I'd like you all to take a moment to, especially those of you that are remote into this, to acknowledge where you are. Um, it's a pretty easy search. There are several websites that will come up if you look basically whose who's indigenous land am I on right now. Um, yeah, okay. So um, this is the copyright information. Um, basically, you're free to share this. You're free to adapt it. Um, just make sure you attribute everything. Uh, let's see. Let's go over who we are. Yeah. Um, I can start. Um, I, oh, you have a few <laughs> slides here before we get to our yes, things. Sorry. Okay. Let's talk about gene methylation. So sure. Amy's probably <laughs> the expert on gene methylation out of the two of us. I work with it every day, but, um, sure, yeah. thesis is DNA methylation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we are here to talk about DNA methylation and how to do DNA methylation analyses today. And thank you all for joining us. Um, you probably know a little bit about what DNA methylation is. It's a covalent addition to the DNA strand um, that interacts with how genes are expressed and it's not always a clear cut relationship. So I'm not gonna um, give you any hard and fast rules. People often say that methylation in the promoter region is associated with decreased expression. Um, that is often true, but not always. So it's a complicated relationship and that's kind of why we're interested in studying it because it is also quite a stable mark. So if you have tissues that you've collected um, that have been sitting in the freezer for years, I think they've checked up to 72 months at room temperature, even DNA methylation is stable. Um, and things like RNA wouldn't be to look at gene expression patterns. So it's a, it's a useful mark from that perspective. And like a lot of other marks, you can think of DNA methylation as kind of like a physical barrier that's added on to DNA and will prevent other things or attract things to DNA. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's kind of important in, in my research. So I have this big set of bars over here. Um, <laughs> My research is in MQTL analysis. So I look at the association between um, common mutations on DNA and increased or decreased methylation and then try to tie that to different traits. Um, Amy and I both involve sex differences in our research. So my plots out here show that the liability to different um, types of complex uh, human traits can sometimes be better explained when you're looking at um, these genetically regulated methylation sites um, in males and females separately than um, when you combine samples. So that, that's kind of my main thesis work. And Amy, what's, yeah. what's your main thesis work here? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a PhD student in Wendy Robinson's lab and we study developmental epigenetics. So we do a lot of placenta work um, looking at the organ that supports the baby during gestation. And there are sex differences at autosomal loci as well in terms of DNA methylation. So not just on the X and Y chromosome, although um, I'm interested in kind of the whole genome and specifically the X in the placenta and how it may be differently regulated than the X in other tissues. Uh, and so this plot on the right is showing um, a PCA analysis of several autosomal loci. So no X or Y in this plot um, that do separate samples fairly well by sex chromosome complement. So the males are shown in red and the females in yellow. And um, if you look at traits that are correlated with sort of the samples PCA score along axis one, uh, females that are more negative towards the left of the plot have an increased birth weight standard deviation, which is already a sex adjusted measure. Um, so that's surprising to us. And males that are more towards the right of the plot uh, tend to have mothers that are older 
So those two factors seem to differentiate some um, sex differences on the autosomes. And if it gives you an insight into what my expertise is, I totally forgot that my project is about placenta. Um, yeah. <laughs> so all the changes I talked about are with respect to placental tissue as well. Um, and that's kind of how Amy and I are involved with each other's research. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the okay. data set we're using today. Yes, I added this slide in to give you guys a bit of context into what we're doing. Um, this is a data set that's publicly available. It was generated by the Robinson Lab um, in 2016, maybe. It is a placenta data set. So we've taken, I have shown you a schematic there of um, a fetus in utero. And that organ that you see kind of along the top edge of the uterus is the placenta. And it is a fetally derived tissue that supports all sorts of molecular transport during gestation um, and interfaces between the maternal and fetal blood. And we have sampled this and run DNA methylation analyses using the 450K array to look at DNA methylation at 450,000 CPG sites genome wide. And the original results of this analysis are published in that paper there from Sam Wilson. And one of her figures there shows the the placental DNA methylation clusters the samples um, by pathology. And she looked at preeclampsia. And when you say fetally derived, could you be explicit about what that means? Mm -hmm. So the sperm and the egg early in gestation meet and create a zygote and all of the cells that contribute to the baby come out of that zygote, but all of the cells that contribute to the placenta also come out of that zygote. It divides, divides, and then half of them become the baby and half of them become the placenta. And so none of the placental cells are actually maternal in origin. They have the same sex chromosome complement as the baby. So it's all, it's all fetal tissue. None of this is taken from the mother. There is contamination and there are all Mm -hmm. sorts of fun research on that, that comes out of the Robinson lab too. But yeah, we're looking at it's genetically the same as the rest of the fetus. Um, so here's our overview. Um, first, Amy is going to cover the intricacies of processing array data from a luminous 450K array. Um, and then I'll be talking about um, differential methylation analysis. So we're going to be doing some statistics and linear modeling. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, here are our prerequisites. Um, we hope that everyone here is familiar to some degree with our studio and our markdown. Um, all of our materials will be online and we will share everything with you after this. So if things are a little bit too fast, be sure to review, revise, um, and always, if you're completely lost, please, please ask questions. Um, we will be able to work through things with you. Um, so yeah, um, you may need to go over this multiple times Um, You should be able to run all this on your personal computer if um, Sockeye does not work out for some reason. Um, Yeah, so unless you're running this on like a cell phone, you should be able to to do everything. Okay, so we're learning objectives. We're going to be able to parse raw DNA methylation data to beta values. We'll go over what that means. We're gonna talk about how to filter that data to get just these sites that you would likely be interested in um, for any sort of like real project. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about linear modeling and then principal components analysis. So hopefully you'll, you'll understand a little bit more about the plots we shared from our own research after this. Um, and we have a nice prepared R Markdown document for you to go through after um, and also to run alongside. Um, we're going to go through each line of code and we're going to explain what's happening. Um, we've left some exercises for you guys um, to go through, but we're going to reconvene after most of the exercises and go through what they are all about. Um, okay, so mm-hmm. this is Amy's section. I'm just going to sit back. Yeah. Okay. So before we get into the code, I'm going to give you an overview of what we'll be doing to the data so that you have some context before we jump in. Um, the kind of primary steps that you have to, or you should probably do when you're analyzing Illumina DNA methylation microarray data are to, um, remove first poor quality samples. So samples that have failed for contamination, like Will mentioned from maternal DNA or samples that have been swapped um, on your array and you know that they're not genetically who they think they are, who you think they are. Um, you should also remove probes. So we're gonna be using probes and CPG sites interchangeably. The words mean functionally the same thing in the context of this workshop. Um, and so probes that are poor quality or reporting poor quality data should also be removed from your data set. And finally, you're going to want to normalize your data. And if you look at this in a nice flow chart, you start with a raw um, 
raw data object in the form of an IDAT file. For each sample, you'll have two IDAT files, one that measures red fluorescence and one that measures green. Um, and you'll load those files into R, which is a slow step, so we've done that for you, but we're providing the code for that if you happen to have IDATs for yourself. Um, you'll then take it through sample quality control, probe filtering, and normalization, and end up with a pre-processed data object that um, is in the form of beta values or M values that you can then take into um, Will's section for analysis. And briefly, the types of probes that you may be interested in removing are firstly, um, those that tend to be called poor quality. And what this means is that um, the probe fluorescence, which is how the array measures DNA methylation, is not able to be reliably distinguished from background fluorescence. So the probe is very dark against the background of the array. And you can quantify that with a detection p-value and a significant value would mean that that probe is significantly different from background and you can quantify it. So that's a good probe. And anything that's not significantly different than background is a poor quality probe that we would want to remove. So things with a high detection p-value in a certain percentage of samples. Thank you. Perfect. Um, the second class of probe that we're going to be talking about today are probes that are called polymorphic. And what that means is that each CPG on the array is interrogated by a physical probe that's 50 nucleotides of sequence in length that hybridizes to a target sequence in the genome. Um, and if there are SNP loci underlying that 50 nucleotide sequence, it can interfere with how that probe binds the DNA that it's intended to target, and that can interfere with the signal that you're measuring from the array. Um, and there are databases out there that people have created to index where these probes are and which should be removed, and we will be excluding them as well. And the third class of probe we'll be talking about today are called non-specific or cross-hybridizing. And so, as I was just saying, here's a schematic of the 50 nucleotide probe sequence. And that 50 nucleotide probe sequence is intended to be really specific to one region in the genome and to only bind that region and nowhere else. But um, that's a bit of an idealistic view and that's not true in every case, especially once you bisulfite convert the DNA to measure DNA methylation, it loses a lot of its complexity. And um, probes may, in theory, have been predicted to bind to multiple possible locations in the genome and the probes that are indexed as such, we will also remove. The final processing step today will be normalization. So. There are two sort of chemical um, types of probes included on the array and they function slightly differently than each other. Their fluorescence measurements occur slightly differently. And what that uh, results in is that the type two probes as they're called uh, generally have a smaller dynamic range of fluorescence than the type one probes. And people have found that when you run analyses on the two probe types, uh, type two are generally less reproducible unless you normalize that distribution to make it look more like a type one probe. And that is often um, the, the intention of normalization. And we will be conducting that today. The data structures you'll be encountering when you work with DNA methylation are broadly as follows. Um, first, I already mentioned our IDAT files that are the absolute raw data that comes out of the high scanner or the eye scanner machine. Um, these are then transformed into what's called an RG set or an RG channel set, uh, which has the data stored as red or green fluorescence intensity. So it's not at the DNA methylation level yet. Um, it also stores information on uh, kind of quality control things and how the array run went in the lab um, and a manifest for the probe design, which probe targets which region in the genome. It also can store metadata for your data um, object, which is often called PDAT. And then that gets transformed to a methyl set or an M set through normalization, um, which contains the methylated and unmethylated intensities. So they've taken the red green and converted it to methylated and unmethylated for each of the two probe chemistries. And further from that, you can calculate a beta value, which is the proportion of methylated signal over total signal. Um, so you use the methylated and unmethylated channels to calculate a beta value 
or an M value, which is the log of the ratio of methylated over unmethylated. And there are, um, I've added some notes here for your own interest um, in terms of which of the beta and M values should be used for what. Typically, uh, it's better to use an M value for statistical analyses for, for a couple of different reasons. And often effect sizes are reported in terms of beta values. And you can convert freely between the two. Um, yes. So kind of like if you have one result that you derived using an M value, you can always convert it back to a beta value to plot it out. I think with that, and here's just a schematic of what I was describing, and a link to a paper if anyone is interested. Paperish thing. Uh, and this is the interconversion between, or sort of a visualization of how beta and M values are calculated, um, from which you can understand that they would be easily interconvertible. Okay, right. so we're going to set up our working environment on Sakai. But before that, um, does anyone have any questions for Amy? Um, about what we just covered. Um, and online people, um, questions will be relayed to us if, mm -hmm. if we don't pick them up in the chat. Um, so please feel free um, to ask there or on the code share. One of our TAs can also answer. All right. Questions. No questions. Sure. Great. Um, so we're not gonna, okay, so we're going to navigate to this workshop GitHub page uh, if you want to look at the actual like code online. Um, for those of you that may be following this more closely later, um, I will go through what we're going to be doing on Sakai step-by-step, step. Um, but we are under this intro to EWAS folder. Here's a setup to try to do this at home later. Um, but for those of you that are here for the tutorial in real time, please, um, Bear with me as I go through some of this. Uh, so, oh, I accidentally clicked the annotation button. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to first open up Sakai. Uh, we're going to make sure that you've already created your own working directory on the precision health allocation that they have given us. Um, I'm just going to do my own little login to Sakai here. Um, I have a lot of stuff saved where I can just do SSH Sakai, but you will have to do a command that's like this, your username, your CWL at it's arc dot Sakai. Dot Sakai. Sakai dot arc. Sorry. Oh, Sakai yeah. dot arc dot UBC dot CA. It'll ask you for your two factor, so hopefully you have that set up. Mine is an app on my phone, so I'm gonna do that. They'll give you this beautiful ASCII art of a fish. Um, yeah, so if everyone makes this student space, um, I will use my own scratch directory that I have with my lab just because I know everything is set up there. Um, so uh, that for me is here, but please, please make this directory here. Um, I will run that command with you. Uh, make dir dash p. This will basically say if it's already created, nothing will happen. Scratch that tr precision health one workshop student spaces. And then, yeah. You can see it, all of the users that are there. I'm sorry to dox everyone here. Um, yeah, so let's see. Amy has hers. Actually, you know what? I will make one here. We're doing this in real time. All right, this is what I will do. Please replace it with your CWL. Oh, for sure I can make this bigger, yeah. How about that? All right, great. Let me just make this the bottom half of the screen. All right, cool. And I'm gonna be switching between my terminal window and this pretty much throughout, so. Can I hide this bar? Yeah. Oh, great. Nope. Oh, you have to close your annotator first. Okay. Is that under? On your annotator box? Yeah, so you can just drag that. Yeah. 
Oh, there it is. There's the X button. Okay. I will just move this all the way over here. So I have that little more thing if I need it. Okay, so that is one step ahead. We're going to make our own little home folder on this directory. Um, so let's see where I am on this. Let's exit out of this window. Okay, so here we are in Sakai. There's my window here, and this is kind of the example I have. We are going to switch into the directory we just made. Um, I'm going to do like a little hefty control C or control shift C copy and go into my directory here. It should be empty or if you've done another workshop, there should be something in there if you type LS. Um, what I'm going to do next is create a home directory. Um, so if you type PWD, it should say the directory you just switched into. I'm going to make this directory and I'm going to call it MWAS work. Great. And then finally, I will copy the code from the Precision Health Workshops to this area using the command CP, which is copy, dash R, which means copy everything in the folder. Scratch. Nope, not scratch. It's under project. TR. Precision health. If you see me completing things, I'm pressing tab when I've half typed something out, it will autocomplete for you so you don't have to remember quite so much. It's under precision, virtual environment, workshops, intro to EWAS, and that's the whole folder. And I'm going to copy it to dot, which is the current location. And this will take some time. Um, we're just going to wait for that to copy over. If I am going too slow, if you want things to be repeated, let me know. Um, so when everything is copied, you type ls. You should be in um, this directory. I accidentally put it in the wrong one. So I'm going to move enter to EWAS to this MWAS work folder. Um, if you get stuck or I'm going too fast, I did write out slash make a little photo of all of the commands that I've been calling, um, in the sheet. If anyone doesn't have access to the, um, PowerPoint, let me know, um, it should be shared on our code share. And if you were here at the start, I put it in the chat as well. Okay. So we should be in this directory with MWAS work. I'm going to change into there. We list what directory we're in. This is something that you should see instead of W Casaza, that's me. You should have your CWL there. Okay. Um, now here's for the more complicated part. We have a little job script that will start our studio for us. Um, we are going to change some elements of it. Um, so it will run on the allocation that we have for this. We're going to change it to this allocation here, the STS Turby one. We're going to change it to the directory that we just created. And we're going to um, change this environment file for running our studio to um, the file we just copied. Um, so let's do all of that. Um, I will make this a little bigger and walk through what editing that looks like. There are many ways to edit text files on Sakai. I'm going to use Nano because it's, it tends to be less bracing for first time. Um, but there's also Vim, Emacs, a whole bunch of other things. Um, but that's aside from the main point. We're going to go CD, intro to EWAS. Right now we're in this file, this folder. OK, Nano, MWAS, RStudio job. This is the job file. Um, yeah, this is what everything looks like. If you can see from the first thing we have to do, we need to change the amount of time. We're just going to set it to as much time as this could possibly take, which is two and a half hours, which I, I doubt will go there, but we'll see. 
um, we're going to change its job home directory to the folder that we just created. Um, so this will be under scratch. Um, basically this folder we made right here. Um, I, you'll see that my working memory is not the best. So I'm going to have to be copying. If you exit out of this with control X, I'm going to save. I'm going to uh, just press enter after that. Here I am. Okay, so our home directory will be MWAS work. Gonna copy that. Uh, let's go. This is the directory we need to edit. I'm gonna paste it in here. Um, and then the SIF file should be under intro to EWAS data to MWAS.SIF. And then we're going to write out with control O. We don't want to change the name of the file. And then control X to exit. Um, And lost work. Yeah. Um, just to show how we can do file navigation, um, it can be as long as you, if you're familiar with with setting up our studio, um, you can really make those two directories whatever you want. It's just important that you have the the direct location for the SIF file, and you can navigate to these these files um, for everything. Okay, so. If we just take the head of that file, you should see, yep, we changed that. Oh, I didn't change this allocation. This should be st turvy. Oh. I should have access to this allocation too. Great. All right. And then after exiting, we will submit our job with this Q sub command. And then we're going to follow the instructions. Um, anywhere you see W Casaza, that should be your CBL. Just make sure that you're um, following along with your own account. All right. Q sub will start the job on Sakai. You'll get this job ID as an output. What we're looking for is a connection file. Um, let's see if the job starts running with QStat. Our user is that. Um, and then we'll see that the job is running, um, which means if I type ls, there should be this connection file here. And then to view the instructions on our terminal, we're going to do cat and then which will list all the instructions here. At this point, we are going to get this command, which we have to open up in a, another terminal. I'm gonna open another terminal window here. Okay, and then I'm going to paste that command into my terminal. Um, oh, I forgot to change the size going to log in. What this does is it basically makes it so um, you can access the RStudio server instance on Sockeye, um, even though the Sockeye like, jobs are not connected to the internet. So basically, you're just making it so you can log into Sockeye first and then see the RStudio that's running on Sockeye from there. Um, that's not all important to know. All you need to know is that you need to do this little extra step after running the job. Once you log in, going back to the instructions, it'll say that your web browser should be pointed to this. Um, on my terminal, I can just click this. 
And now we're going to exit out of the PowerPoint and actually get into running our studio. Um, for everyone in person and online, just let me know if that's not big enough. Um, can everyone here see this? Okay. Okay, it, look, it looks pretty good from my end. I'm going to follow the instructions on the, oh, on this sheet that I have. Um, my username is WXaza. I generated this random password. And then I'm going to go and paste that. Um, I'm going to check this box um, and sign in. Yeah, OK. Um, is everyone at the point where they've logged in? Everyone here is good? OK, so if other people are good, that means all of the file, you have permissions to read everything I've created, so that's great. Um, we're going to start our workshop. Let me just make sure that I have the right slide. OK, so right now, we've gotten to this login page. Yeah, let's do that. Let's just make sure. Um, do I generate that poll or? Awesome, thanks, Phil. And as always, ask questions. Um, if anyone in the room also wants to just raise their hand and ask, feel free. Okay, we have the poll results. Are you set up in the same RC folder as Will shows? Except with your own. Um, let's get to my window so everyone sees what that looks like. There's a no. There's a no, but that's fine. That's one out of three people that have responded and we'll see how many people. There are 22 people online. Okay. Should look something like this. People are logging in. I hear computer fans. Mm -hmm. That's how you know that things are working. OK, we got five people <laughs> who, uh, that who have responded. Four of them say yes. The statistician in me says that that might not be representative of the whole group. Um, yeah, there we go. Oh, no. <laughs> More people are not on. Yeah, this is where the most problems happen. Um, everything on our sheet can be run locally. Um, um, but for today, we've set up everything to run on Sakai. Um, so ideally, you'd be able to start it. Um, but if you want to go back to our GitHub, I have some directions on there for how you would download everything and start setting it up on your own. Can you show us your script again on the menu? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, so that script you should have copied into your directory. So it should be under, yeah, let's get that CP command up. I copied it from, Yeah, sure. And as you're typing this path out along the way, you can press tab. Did you do the dash R? We got the data. We did the data from the Oh, yeah. You do the whole folder. We could. Paste it in the Zoom chat too. Yeah. Probably on the code share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can paste this in the chat as well. Okay. So you want to run this in your 
little MWAS folder that you've created. So we'll be in MWAS work. And when you're in MWAS work, you will copy this command um, that I just typed in the chat here. And that dot after everything is important, that just means copy everything in that folder to the, your current location. So the, script. the script, yeah, the script is under intro to EWAS. We'll be in here. Um, we're going to go to MWAS our studio job. And the one that you're missing is data? But she's missing it in studio. Okay, so I think what you should do if you've copied everything and not everything is there, switch out back to right above the intro to EWAS folder. What you'll want to do is run the command rm dash r intro to EWAS, remove everything, and then just copy it again. Yeah, it's definitely still there on project. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and continue. Okay. All right. So um, hiccups aside, let's see, where are we with the, the polls closed? We're all good. Okay. So let's go back to our studio. We're going to navigate to the intro to EWAS folder. This is the folder we were just in on Sakai. We're going to open up this EOPE EWAS workflow document. And from there, I think, ooh, Amy is going to help. This is Amy's section, but I can, I can give a little introduction um, while, while things are getting covered. Um, let's make this all a little bigger here. Okay. So I had the benefit of doing the first draft of this tutorial when I was first learning MWAS stuff way back like two or three years ago um, under the supervision of the Robinson Lab a little bit. Um, <laughs> not in an official capacity, but um, I was able to ask them all sorts of questions. So that's kind of where this all comes from. Um, it's going to walk through, we're going to walk through a little bit of downloading data. Um, again, if you don't remember the publication we're working from, it's this um, Wilson et al. 2016 paper from the Robinson Lab. Um, there's a little link to it here. Um, all of the packages for this tutorial should already be installed. If you're going to be running this later on your own setup without these packages installed, this is what we will require. Um, so everything should be installed for you if you're using our our image on Sakai, that SIF file to run this job. We're going to run the first command, which loads everything in. If something is wrong with your setup, this is most likely where it will come up um, while you're set up after starting the job. Everything's going to load in. Minfi takes a while. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so if you look into your console, this is the result of running all those commands. Should split out a lot of like morning, um, but those are all fine. It's just telling you what new functions are defined, and which old functions don't apply anymore. Anyhow, um, the data for this tutorial is already in the data folder on on Sockeye that you've copied. Um, but later, you can download it from um, GEO Gene Expression Omnibus, which has DNA methylation and, and RNA seq, and also. Well, not, not RNA seq, um, DNA methylation and expression array data um, from many different studies. Okay. So if you're going to work with the raw data um, here, you make sure that you have um, MinFi available. Um, there's a tutorial for working from the IDAT files that Amy was talking about that have like raw red and green fluorescence um, from the methylation array there. Um, but we're going to be working from. Uh, the matrix file. Um, let's see. Um, we're going to load in 
this raw data that we've saved. Um, the commented out code is what you would run um, to parse out the raw file that's downloaded from gene expression on a bus geo. This will take a little bit to run. So I'm going to run that. Great. We have our RG set. Um, we can view what the RG set looks like as well. Um, it's a big old object. So I'm going to do this command here to view what's in it. It has all these different slots for everything. We know we have 102 samples. We know we have reds and greens and some metadata, but not a lot. Um, we're also going to load in the processed data from GEO for a comparison. We have this E set that will take longer because it has a lot of metadata and stuff in it as well. And when we're done, we're just going to run that command. We're going to run this to see what it looks like. We have this expression set, which in this case is a methylation set, has all these slots for information and great feature names, which are our CPG site probes. And then let's see, now we have an annotation which is a bunch of information on each of the CPG sites on the 450K array. And we're going to load that in. And this is the last command that takes like a ton of time. Um, I think, Amy, do you want me to go over formatting? Sure. OK, and then we'll uh, pass things off sure. once we're going into filtering. Yeah. OK. Sure. OK. Can you talk a little bit about the data files that you Heck yeah, I can talk about these data files. Um, so Gene Expression Omnibus is this big database of expression and methylation data. They have all sorts of um, information fields that people who submit their data to be publicly available can fill out. Um, essentially, the RG channel, channel set is what you have for um, methylation data specifically. It's from MinFi. It has information like the fluorescence of red and green probes, whether or not those probes are type one or type two probes. Um, for each of the CPG sites on the 450K array, as well as each of the samples, um, if I take this down, the stir function basically tells you what all the different slots in this big object you are. You can think of it as like a big drawer a big set of drawers with a bunch of little drawers you can pull out and some of them have different compartments in them. They're kind of messy, which is why we spend some time over like getting this into a format that's nice to work with in R. Um, but essentially it has all the information you would need to recreate whatever publication they're associated with. Um, that, that's, that's what they ideally should have. So the words, the RG set is like red and green fluorescence values. Um, the GSE, the expression set or the E set is the processed methylation that the um, authors submitted. Um, in there somewhere is going to be a matrix of beta values, of methylation beta values for each subject, for each probe. Um, and also the um, phenotype data. So the, um, in this case, it would be preeclampsia status. Um, we're looking at a paper that deals with um, different types of growth restriction um, and birth complications in placental data and placental gene, and then um, try to associate that with placental gene inflation. Um, we'll go over what those phenotypes are later, but all of that phenotypical information and the beta values that have been processed by the authors are in the ESET. Um, and then this annotation here is a nice formatted um, file that we took from the uh, Illumina website. Um, they're the makers of this 450K array. Um, you can see it's with respect to this genome build here. What this has is all sorts of different information on each probe. If you look at the head of it, 
we can see that we got the chromosome, the beginning of the probe, the end of the probe, um, whether or not it's, they're talking about the plus or minus strand, probe's ID, whether or not it's red, green, or both. Lots of different things, um, including and up to what genes are overlapped or targeted by these CBG sites. Um, yeah, essentially a lot of a lot of information for however you want to end up using the methylation data you have, or whatever other types of data you want to copy it to. Um, Amy, you added these masks in here too, which are about filtering out some stuff from the data that would kind of mess up your MLOS results. Um, and we'll, we'll go for that later. Okay. Um, so let's format this data into a matrix that we can actually work with with our functions a lot, a lot more easily. Um, this P data function. What it does is it takes out the phenotype data from the E set. So now we just have each sample, description of the sample, when it's been submitted, and then also things like their pathology group, their sex, and their gestational age. There are a bunch of weird things in the column naming that just happen to get tacked on when you submit data. We're going to take off these little parts of the column names that are CH1 so we can read the columns a little bit better. <laughs> um, and then we're going to just select the variables we want to analyze from this to make it look a lot simpler. So after running all the commands in this chunk, you'll get the relevant phenotypes for our e loss analysis, which are pathology group, the fetal sex, and then also the gestational age, i.e. Um, the number of weeks from gestation from the start of, so is it from conception, Amy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the number of weeks from conception uh, that the placenta was collected at. Okay, and now we're going to do some data cleaning from here. I'm gonna pass it off to Amy. Um, cool, okay. thank you. Um, and for those of you that don't know, gestation in humans is 40 weeks long. So if you were born before 37, that's really early. Um, before 40 is a bit early, but yeah. Before 34 is extremely early. And now so. a little about this sample. It's expected, right? It'll mm -hmm. be early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So this this particular pathology here shown in the table is called early onset preeclampsia. Um, and part of the diagnosis of that disorder is the gestational age at which a sample was born. Can you show us what you mm -hmm. have in your environment? Yes. Are you missing? No, I'm just making sure I've got everything. <laughs> All right, so stop me if there are any questions um, online and in-person attendees. Did the data work for you? Just um, yeah, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, so in this data set are a couple of replicate samples, which means the same pool of DNA that we extracted from a placenta was run on the array multiple times so that you can estimate um, technical variance in the DNA methylation array measurements. For the purposes of this workshop, we are actually not going to spend too much time um, looking at those replicates, so we will be removing them. And we do that with a base R um, subset line of code that identifies the samples called replicate in the pathology group column. And after they are removed, if you look at that column and the different levels of information that are stored in it, there are no more samples um, categorized as replicates. Yes. Yes. So the question was, um, is there any way we can group the replicates and save them somewhere separately so that we can look at them on their own? And so I have already removed them. So this line of code won't run at the moment. But if you wanted to do that, you would basically do um, the inverse of this, where instead of 
selecting to drop the replicates, you are selectively keeping them. Sorry, new keyboards are always hard. Um, and so this line of code would be selectively keeping the replicates in an object that we're naming replicates. And it would have the same columns as the metadata, but only rows corresponding to the replicate samples. And that is, yeah, definitely something that you can do. Um, secondly, we are going to check out the structure of our different metadata variables. And notice that gestational age encoded um, from the geo object is actually a character vector at the moment. And we will be converting that, we know it's a number, uh, we'll be converting it to a numeric variable. And if we, again, take the structure after conversion, you can now see that gestational age is a numeric variable. And if we look at the head of our cleaned up metadata, we have the three same three columns um, for a number of samples. And after filtering, how many samples do we have? Uh, 94. So this is the sample filtering step that we mentioned earlier. Typically there would be more extensive sample filtering. You could check sex, gestational, or sex and identity and things like that. And um, we're, we're gonna skip that for now, but in the interest of time, because typically the processing is more um, intensive and we wanted to go over that. So I'm going to press run on line 149 in my script. It'll be around there for you. I've, we've added a few extra line of code, lines of code um, just because this line will take a second. So I'm gonna let it run while I explain what it's doing. Um, and here you can see that we have taken the input object, um, our RG set, which Will mentioned contains the red and green fluorescence intensity values. And we're putting that into a function called preprocess noob. And noob is a word that stands for normalized exponential out of band normalization. It's a really sort of basic, very minimal normalization procedure that corrects for background fluorescence and um, color channel differences. And it's super gentle. Um, there are many other normalization procedures you can use specifically if you're interested in really aggressively adjusting the type one and type two distributions. Um, and there are many papers out there that you can look at uh, to kind of choose between the normalization algorithms and select what is best for your data, depending on factors like whether you have more than one tissue in your data set, um, or if you have uh, pretty clean data, you might want to use something more gentle, things like that. So we will let that run. That happened very nicely. And from this MSET object, we can take a look at it. Um, and if you will remember the slides, we mentioned that instead of the red and green fluorescence intensity, which were contained in the RG set, the methyl set has now transformed those um, fluorescence measurements to methylated and unmethylated signal. And so for each probe, each CPG, you have a number, it's somewhere in the thousands that um, corresponds to the fluorescence intensity in the methylated channel for that probe. And you have a corresponding measurement for the fluorescence intensity in the unmethylated channel for all of your probes, 485,000. And right now we have all of our samples in this object, 102, um, because we have not removed the replicates from the data object yet, just from the metadata. Where are these two commands coming from? Which package? The uh, preprocess noob is a minfi function. Same with data? Yes, I believe so. So it loads this Illumina methylation mm -hmm. data set. Yeah. That's it, why it's such a heavy library. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't load the data set. It normalizes the data set that you give it. Um, it's not loading anything. It, on it its loads own. in the annotation to know whether or not they're type one or type two probes. Yeah. Okay. So it yeah. can run the, the normalization procedure that Amy was talking about. So for every probe, this Illumina methylation 450K anno is just labeling probes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then if you run this next line of code, get beta on the methyl set, uh, it should be much faster and it will return an object that we've called betas because it contains the beta values for each of your 485,000 CPGs. 
and I was going to just take a preview of that. Um, so you can see each row is a CPG and each column is a sample. And in the cells are values that range between zero and one that correspond to beta values, which is, you can think of it roughly as the proportion of cells in your sample that are methylated. So in this particular um, sample at the CPG, 40.48 of your cells have uh, full methylation at that particular locus. Now we will move on to um, detection p-value filtering. And so we have a lot of explanation um, written here that you can go back and read later in case anything that we're saying now doesn't make sense or you're not able to run the code alongside with us. Um, but and images, and images in the PowerPoint as well. And images in the PowerPoint, yes. Yeah. We have a lot of extra information. And this is another step that I'm gonna get started running um, while I talk over it. So detection P is another min fee function that you run on the RG set. And it gives you um, an object that we've called that P that's a matrix of um, values that are P values for whether or not that probe is reliably distinguished from background. And once that finishes, we will be taking that object um, which has the P values and transforming it into a logical matrix of the same size um, by asking whether or not each value in each cell is greater than our detection p-value threshold of 0 0.01. And then probes that are not greater or that are, that are not passing this threshold that are less than, sorry, that are greater than 0 0.01, um, we will be indexing how many of them per probe, per row, fail in more than 10% of our samples. And this 10% is a criteria that we're using here. People use different values depending on how stringent you wanna be. Um, you could drop anything that fails in more than 1% of your samples, for example, or more than 20% if you'd like to be um, more lenient. And so looking at the very top of that detection P matrix, you have really small values. These are P values again, and um, we're going to now apply that call of asking whether each value in each cell is greater than 0 0.01. And so all of these probes in this sample are less than 0 0.01. They're significantly different than background. Um, but in this sample, they're all greater. So you cannot reliably distinguish them from background. And what we're really interested in here is not in each probe in each sample on its own, but whether a probe is reliably bad across a certain number of your samples. So in this step we will be asking whether um, it fails in more than 10%. And if you look at how many, a quick summary of how many probes are failing out of your 485,000, only 608, which is not bad. And so let's just take a quick look at what this object actually looks like. I did not mean to do that. Is 608 typical? Yeah, it's like I feel somewhere in the thousands is is pretty standard. So would you say that it's the Robinson Labs superior technique that <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I can take credit for it. Maria can definitely take credit for it. Um, <laughs> our lab manager is very careful. So we do tend to have better quality data than some data sets out there. Um, not to throw any other placenta labs under the bus, but there's a couple on Geo that are really bad. Uh, but it also has to do with the quality of the, the DNA that you're running. So if you run a super degraded, super old placenta, you will have more probes failing um, because the DNA is just so fragmented that it's not binding uh, super well to the array. Cut off, so you got your 0 .01. Mm -hmm. The 0.01 is standard, definitely. The 10% is more loosely standard. It ranges anywhere between sort of 1% and 20% as common cutoffs. And there, there, doesn't, there isn't a great consensus in the literature. It also depends a bit on how many samples you have. Um, if you have 16 and you're looking at like cell type specific methylation, you would probably use something more lenient like 20%. Um, yeah, so people go back and forth. Are they typically the same probes that fail or is it the same? There is some correlation between the probes that fail. Um, 
yeah, it's not perfectly overlapping, but like the, there are flaws in probe design for sure. And Illumina in the Epic array, which is a later version of the array, um, has actually released several versions of the annotations where they fully exclude sets of probes, like as many as 900 in a single update, because they, even though the chemistry of the array stays the same, how they want you to read the array, they want you to never look at those 900 and things like that. And so that would be taken care of as a Illumina step? Mm -hmm. That's taken care of super early when we create the RG set. Right. Um, and with the Epic reading of the RG set, you have the option to choose which um, manifest you'd like to read it in with. And it's like maybe a good thing, maybe a bad thing that they give you that freedom, but it, it does alter how many probes you are seeing in your output objects. Okay, and so if we look at our debt pfail um, list of probes that is failing, we have for each probe on the array, a true or a false value for whether um, we would like to remove it for failing a detection p-value check. And so we're gonna remove it from our beta values matrix in this step by first looking at how big the beta object is before we filter and then excluding um, the inverse of debt p fail. So anything that is marked true, we will be dropping um, because it's failing. There's a lot of reverse logic in this step, but just bear with me. And then if we look at how big it is after filtering, we have dropped those 600 pose and ended up at 484,000. Now we will move on to the uh, cross hybridizing and polymorphic probes. And the annotation that we read in earlier, the object called Anno, is actually um, not strictly the Illumina uh, brand annotation. It's, it's from a publication out of a, a lab um, in the US that has done a lot of work on the array and they have done in silico analyses to identify which probes are predicted to be cross hybridizing and which probes are predicted to be polymorphic. And that's where all of those extra columns that Will was talking about that start with the word mask at the end come from. And so this, um, this lab, you can actually go, they have a great Dejao lab. Oh, I have to Google it every time though. I believe in the sheet, there's also links to some of these publications. That's probably true. Um, Is this them? They've recently changed. Maybe it's in here. Yeah, I would, I would check. I'm pretty sure I put some of them in there. Oh, yes. So this is the publication where they talk about it all. And then this is the link to their GitHub repository, um, which has several versions of their annotation for both the HG38 and HG19 builds. Uh, of the genome, they've listed over the array annotations to HG38. And they provide EPIC 450K and the even older version 27K array annotations with all of their extra columns on which probes you should be removing and which um, are trustworthy. And they also provide this handy column legend section on their, um, on their site. And the mask general column, this is very small, but if we um, read their description of mask general. It's what they recommend for general purpose masking. Um, and it's the merge of their columns, mask sub 30 copy, mask mapping, max X space, max, mask next type one, next space switch and mask SNP 5 GMAF 1P. So essentially this is taking everything that is either um, cross hybridizing from these two categories or polymorphic from these three categories and recommending to drop them um, based on their criteria that you can read more about above if you're interested. I mean, if you remember at the beginning, Amy oh. talked about what cross hybridizing. I just closed our studio. Is. That's okay. If you do full shift T, you should open up the same. Sorry about that, guys. And this is why we checked that box at the beginning. Um, yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Where were we? We were here. All right. So if you look at their annotation and specifically take account of their, uh, hang on, it's loading. Yeah. We'll give it a second. Um, but what we will be doing next 
is taking account of their mask general column to um, get an idea of how many probes they're recommending to mask or remove in this step and how many they would be keeping from the whole array. And then we'll apply those um, filters to our beta values object that we've already dropped um, bad detection p-value probes from. In a second. You might have to refresh, we'll see. Should we refresh? Yeah. Oh no. I'm going to fix this because. Does anybody have questions at this point? <laughs> I might suggest to check the lib pads to make sure they're mm. Oh. If all else fails, we'll just have to restart the job. <laughs> and that's that's usually how this works out on Sorry. Okay. Sorry, guys. It's okay. This could have happened even if you didn't close things out. Yeah. Terminate R. We're gonna have to reload mm -hmm. a lot of the, the work we just did, but that's fine. Hopefully this just goes. Okay. And if this wheel does not go away, that's when we have to start doing some of the fun stuff behind the scenes and a lot of the magic of this all working will, will start to melt away. Um, but that's all right. That's all part of doing research yeah. computing. Once we get it up and running while we are rerunning the code that I just um, erased for us, we can go through little slides maybe yeah. to kind of overlap the time there. Yeah, okay, so I think we're gonna have to rerun things. Um, gonna disconnect from this here. I'm going to see what job was I was running and I'm going to have to delete this. still running. There we go. It is now not running. Great. Okay. So our studio will generate a bunch of stuff for us. I can remove actually this whole folder. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm going to delete these old job files, delete this old connection file. Great, that's running. Hopefully, hi. When I was working in our studio for my thesis work, I would have to do this like 
like yeah. two or three times a day. Um, great, so we're back on here. Let's see if this folder will open. All right, let's okay. run commands and get everything back. Is there I mean, a, there's like there's a run a everything. If you go to the line. Yeah, we were on line. We just talked about detection P cross hybridizing. Yeah, so we can run everything about this chunk. This one? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, if you put your cursor in here. Yeah. And then drop down beside the run menu. Okay. Run all above. Run all above. Cool. Mm -hmm. And that'll be running in the background. Hopefully I don't exit out. Um, there's a little extra stuff going mm -hmm. in um, to what I'll be covering, but since we have the time, I'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, this also will give a little bit of time to catch up for those of you that are just right out of reach of what we've gotten to thus far. Um, so, What is the PCA thing that um, Amy showed earlier? So PCA stands for principle of components analysis. Um, it's an important part of visualizing what we call high dimensional data. And a lot of stuff from genomics, including DNA methylation is high dimensional. And what that means is for each subject or each sample, we measure many, many, many different things um, in this case, 450,000 different methylation sites. And what PCA allows us to do is take those hundreds of thousands of different measurements and visualize them in two dimensions. So if you consider the array as 450,000 dimensions, PCA will be able to describe it in N number of principal components or number N is number of our subjects, um, explaining the most or least variation in our data. Okay, so, oh, sorry, my scroll wheel is here. Okay, so say we have our PCA plot along the first principal component and the second principal component. Um, each plot, each point in this scatter cloud will be mapped back onto each of these PCs and each point in our PCA plot will be a sample. And if we go back to what Amy shared from her research at the way beginning, um, those will often separate along um, variables that um, affect every single probe measured in, in, our, um, in our array. In the case of Amy's work, what we see is that it separates subjects along sex very well. Um, you can see the first PC is probably not only correlated with um, maternal age, but also correlated with sex of the sample. And that's something we're going to be visualizing in our data. Um, we should be close to finishing up that command that you just ran. Yeah. Great. So we ran everything up until this mask. We're going to run the mask and filter out all of these probes. You can see that we started with over 450K um, and ended with under 450K probes. Um, we're going to reorder and remove um, our replicates that we talked about before from this, before visualizing everything. Um, so we're going to do that with a few commands. We'll start with just looking at what beta values we have. We have these probes by these samples. We are going to find out which of the um, rows in our metadata which our samples match up with these samples in our beta values. And then we're going to remove them using this command here, which takes the indices from matched and then selects them from betas. And you'll see now that we have 94 samples um, 
And we're just going to check that the column names and the row names of our metadata are matched, meaning that our samples and our methylation data are in the same order as the samples in our metadata. And now we'll go on to some visualization. Um, some of the basic things you might want to visualize um, are, um, say, age and sex of your samples, just visualizing counts, making sure that you didn't include any data that you didn't want to. Um, we're going to make this nice little reformatted table for that purpose um, because um, ggplot, which is the plotting library we're using that comes from the library tidyverse that you might've seen at the beginning, um, likes data in a nice table where every row is a point or a sample you're going to plot. Um, what we will do is take the first five, um, five subjects and we're going to grab their probes um, and their beta value. Okay, and you can see that now we have this nice table of probe, subject, and beta value. So each row in this data frame is going to be uh, a methylation beta for a particular subject for a particular probe. And then if we run this plot command, it will plot out the density of methylation um, at each of the different uh, for each of the different samples for each of the um, for each different range of beta values. And one interesting thing about DNA methylation in placenta that you don't see in a lot of other tissues is you'll see this little characteristic like tight bump right here um, of intermediate methylation, which has its own own um, line of research actually coming out of UBC um, too from the Hearst lab that talks about intermediate methylation being all sorts of, having all sorts of different properties that um, methylation at these different peaks tends to not have, um, i.e. the probes that tend to be mostly unmethylated or the probes that tend to be mostly methylated within each sample. Um, so that's nice. Um, so our data looks more or less right after normalization. We can also look at different phenotypic characteristics of our data. There is the bar plot, the geome bar, which will show um, just counts. Over now, we're just plotting out counts of each of the different pathology groups. Um, there's you can count sex. You can do all sorts of things. You can count. Um, you can change whether or not those bars are stacked on top of one another by changing little options to genome bar. You can also plot out a box plot of age versus each pathology group. Um, and for this, um, we can talk a little bit more about plotting if anyone wants to know about plotting. Does anyone have any questions about like, how to visualize data, how to go through everything. Yeah, and this is just a, a, a brief overview of all of the different variables that we're going to be measuring here. Mm -hmm. um, let's get into principal components analysis. Um, R has this nice function called PRComp, um, which you run on a matrix, and that will compute its principal components. We have a matrix of samples by beta values, what we want into PR comp is to have um, a matrix of um, beta values by samples. Um, yeah, I said that correctly. <laughs> and we'll run this PR comp command, which will compute the uh, axes of most variation throughout our data. So it will be it's hard to picture in multiple dimensions, um, but essentially what we'll do what it will do is we'll take the arrow of most variation through all 420 so thousand probes and then assign those to PC1. And then it will take an arrow through our data um, that has the second most, explains the second most variation, amount of variation in our um, methylation data and put that into PC2. And it will go all the way up to PC94, which is the number of samples we have. Um, and this will, 
capture all the variation in our data and it will not um, be, basically you can use this matrix to reconstruct your data exactly um, up to whatever precision your machine has. Um, but first to plot it out, we're just gonna take this data and put it into a data frame. If you see PCs is an object with a bunch of different elements. And the one we're concerned with is X, which is this 94 by 94 matrix. Um, after converting that into a data frame, let's see what it looks like. We'll have our samples on the X axis and then their values along PC one, two or three are in the columns. And plotting these out, you can see that we have a point for each sample and then whether or not they are on PC one or two. And this is where we come to our first exercise. Um, it's gonna integrate a lot of information. Um, if you're familiar with R, it, it might be easier than not. Um, but I think we'll give like two minutes to do this. Um, we're going to add in our metadata to this PC data. Ugh. And then we're just gonna see it. And then, ooh. Yeah. There we go. And this is what combining them will look like. We have our phenotypic variables and we have our PCs for each sample. And we're just gonna plot out by coloring them. Um, you can try to do it along fetal sex, like with Amy's plot. You can do it with gestational age. Um, and then for reference, remember we have all these different types of plots back in the previous block that talk about how you put in different variables. And I'll, and if, if you're completely lost with, with R here, I will walk through like one possible solution to this too. Mm -hmm. Let's take a minute. Okay, so I've given everyone a little head start. I'm going to, in real time, let's type out how we would plot our subjects along PC1 and 2, and then code, color them by, let's say, fetal sex. So we have our plot function, ggplot. This takes in our data and this little AES function where we specify our X and Y variables, which will be PC1, and our Y variable will be we're going to call PC2. And what we want is to color points. So I'm going to set a color 
equal to, let's say it's fetal sex. And then we're going to add on top of that um, points for each subject. And if we run that, that should be, you can see that yes, we do indeed capture, probably capture most of the variation in sex along PC2. If you wanna do like a little correlation like Amy had, we can do correlation between, oh, is there a, yeah, let's do core dot test. Is there a data argument for this? I think you can just use like the columns. Yeah, I'll do that. We're gonna do core dot test PC. And then we're going to do PC one. Okay. And let's actually do PC two because that's what we're talking about. And since this is Oh, okay, we'll have to do this differently because this is binary. So I'm going to say PC2, PC with. We're gonna say if it's correlated with male or female, let's see if that's how, yep, that's how it's encoded. Let's check that out. Oh, whoops. Dot numeric. This will make this column of true, false into zero or one. Oh, and you can see it's very highly correlated. It's basically a negative 0.9, which means that the higher the value is of, of your PC, the um, more likely it is to be a female sample. So that's great. Um, so that's like a little intro to just visualizing your data, um, which is an important step before doing any sort of statistical analysis. Um, we're going to now switch into actually detecting whether or not a probe is methylated differently between um, one pathology group or the other. And before doing that, I'm just gonna switch back to the slides going all the way to where we left off in linear modeling. Okay, so for those of you who have not done any sort of linear modeling before, it's actually a lot similar to what you may have learned in, in um, algebra um, way back in, in, uh, in grade school or in high school. Um, we have a function, um, which is y equals mx plus b, where x is some sort of variable of interest and Y is the beta value of DNA methylation in this case, or some sort of transformation thereof. Um, for example, we might be interested in whether or not increased methylation um, happens at a probe with an increase in age. And what we do is we fit an equation that basically says, yes, it does. And this slope is basically the amount to which age predicts an increase in methylation. But there are a few problems um, with that. Um, first, um, the reason we want to do it this way instead of doing some sort of correlation analysis is that you end up with a more interpretable model. So what we did with the correlation analysis, it will tell you whether or not two variables are associated with one another. Um, but it will not tell you the amount so there's no sense of scale. You won't be able to predict how much one variable contributes to a change in methylation. And two, there are variables that confound the relationship between something like fetal sex and DNA methylation, for example, or age and DNA methylation. And by confounding, what I mean is that that variable could be actually explaining that association that you see there. What linear models allow us to do is to 
take out those confounds from our model. So first step in any of this is defining our research question. In this case, what we want to know is which CPG sites show different levels of methylation in placenta in early onset versus late on onset preeclampsia. That's one question. Or say early onset preeclampsia versus control samples. What we'll do in order to see what might confound that relationship is then look through the literature on preeclampsia and methylation and see whether or not there's anything that comes up that we know will affect um, both of those variables. And what we do know is from literature, fetal sex does affect preeclampsia. Amy, let's say, which, which um, sex is more common to? Females are more common for early yeah. onset. For early onset preeclampsia, it's more common in female fetuses, um, of female births than male births. Um, and for DNA methylation, we know that fetal sex is associated with with um, DNA methylation genome wide. Um, and we know that from the plot we just created. Um, it can is explained by the second most variance PC, that PC2 right there. Um, so taking that into account, we can build a model that accounts for variables that might interfere with the association between status and um, DNA methylation at an individual site. Um, and what that looks like is we set up a formula for how we believe DNA methylation is varying at site I across all subjects. And we have an intercept, which basically rescales our difference um, for each site. And then we have our preeclampsia status and we have the sex. And each of these variables will get fit by our linear model. We'll get a slope that will describe the effect of preeclampsia status on DNA methylation at site I accounting for fetal sex. And you might also hear this called the independent effect of, sorry, the effect of preeclampsia status on DNA methylation independent of the effect of fetal sex on methylation. And this independence part is why we run linear models in the first place. It's a way to control for variation in methylation that might actually be due to some other measurement we're not necessarily interested in. Okay, there's this error term at the end. Um, for those of you that are interested in the stats, I'm gonna go over it briefly. Um, for those of you who are not, you can feel free to check out for just one slide. Um, but essentially um, what a, um, linear model assumes is that that error is normally distributed, meaning that it roughly follows this curve. Um, there are cases where this is not the case, um, and it's part of the reason why we would transform our beta values into n values, because it can lead to getting errors that actually follow this distribution. That being said, Let's talk a little bit about how this is different from a t-test. We talked about how this is different from correlations. Um, the way this is different from a t-test, aside from the accounting for confounds part of it, is actually pretty small. Um, so when we're testing a hypothesis with a t-test, what we're interested in is the mean of one group being different from the mean of another. Um, in a linear model, we can actually derive this t-statistic from beta, so the effect of one variable on another, in this case, it's the effect of disease status on DNA methylation, divided by the error in estimating that particular beta. And we can compare that to our T distribution, a certain number of degrees of freedom, and essentially get out a hypothesis test that basically says, is this group bigger than our intercept? So does having um, early onset preeclampsia on average mean you have a higher DNA methylation than, a, um, than not having early onset preeclampsia? If we have multiple groups, what this turns into is, is ANOVA. Um, it turns into a one-way ANOVA. So if you're familiar with t-tests and one-way ANOVA, a lot of the stats that's working in the background with linear models is, is roughly the same. So when you have multiple groups, say you have um, 
two different types of, of growth restriction in this case. What you're looking at is whether or not any of those groups are different than um, the average across all of them, which is captured in the intercept in your linear model. Um, yeah. Okay. That's the stats behind all of this. That's our acknowledgments, but let's go back to the, <laughs> let's go back to actually running these linear models in R. Just FYI, you had a one hour job with the Oh, I changed it to two hours at the I beginning. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> If your job died, I'm so sorry. Refollow the steps. Okay. Okay. So one way we can express these, this is all the stuff I just talked about, in R is using this model matrix function, which takes in as an argument your metadata and then a formula. What we are doing is we're not going to include an intercept because we're going to talk about differences between groups explicitly, not between groups and the average of all. Um, so that's not as important as making sure that you run this line and you understand the output, which is an encoding for each different pathology group and each different variable. R will take in the, this formula and this data and basically say, all right, for this sample, does it belong to this group? Does it belong to this group? Does it belong to that group, et cetera? And then assign a one if it does. Um, and this is the data that we're actually going to input into Lima, um, which will eventually be used to run all of these linear models across every single DNA methylation site. Um, that we've that we've um, taken out of quality control. And before that, what we're going to do is we're going to convert these to n values. So it follows all of the statistical assumptions I talked about before. And we can see these m values are now not bounded between zero and one and are normally distributed more or less. We can plot that out by first converting it into a nice table that the plotting function will recognize. And then you can see that, sure, they're not perfectly normally distributed, but they more or less resemble this hump. And remember that what we're really concerned with is whether or not the errors of fitting a model, a linear model to each of these CBG sites are normally distributed. And, um, this conversion will um, will um, ensure that that is more or less the case, um, depending on whatever CBG site you're looking at. Great. So now that we have our m values and our model, um, we are going to use the lm fit function, which is from Lima, the LIMMA package, which was designed for doing differential expression analysis, but applies to differential methylation analysis as well. I'm gonna run that. It's gonna take some time. Let's see. And then we're going to fit this, after we fit the model, we can run this eBase function. Um, and what that does is it estimates all of the code. It um, takes the fit linear model and estimates all of the statistics we're interested in, like the um, beta value, standard error of that beta value, and allows us to do hypothesis testing. So out of that, if we take our, oh, all right. If you take this fit and just look at what it is, we'll see that we have this class of multiple linear models with um, the fitted coefficient for each of our different groups and a bunch of information pertaining to computing these statistics that we talked about. Let's just exit out of this. 
what we want to do now is use something called contrasts to extract just the comparisons of interest from these fit-in models. What we're interested here first is looking at um, the difference in um, term samples versus each of these different pathology groups, early onset preeclampsia, late onset preeclampsia, and this intrauterine growth restriction. Um, we're also just going to look at whether or not the sex of our sample is predicting differential methylation at individual sites, which um, it should on its own. Each of, these each of these contrasts is again, like I talked about before, going to be accounting for the difference in methylation due to sex. Okay, so this generates contrasts, basically makes this matrix, which says what comparison you're actually um, running. So you can see that, yes, we're interested in pathology group, early onset preeclampsia versus term early onset preeclampsia controls, late onset versus late onset, intraeating growth restriction versus intraeating growth restriction, and then sex for encoding as male versus not male. So that's how we basically interpret the effects later on. So if something is an increase if something has a positive coefficient later, we now know that that means that it's more likely in males versus females. Okay. This is information talking about what we're comparing to the reference. It explains what's in that contrast matrix, et cetera. One thing you can do for an exercise later is comment take one of the commented out group comparisons and run that and kind of see if there's differential methylation between them. Um, the sample comparisons that I've listed here are um, preterm controls versus these different restriction groups. Um, I think Amy would probably know more about the reason you'd want to compare to term versus preterm controls. Um, so if you have any questions about that, or if you run this later and want to know about the results and what you got, um, feel free to email us and one of us will talk about it with you. Um, so to run each of the comparisons we just specified, we're going to run this contrast.fit function, and then we're going to run the eBase function again to get the stats on those contrasts. And then once that runs, we can extract all of the different stats and actually make conclusions um, from, our, from our, our model. So the first two questions we're going to look at is, are there any difference between percentiles with um, term controls, I should say here, versus early on set preeclampsia, or later on, um, if you want to do the exercise, if there's any difference between preterm controls and mothers with early onset preeclampsia. And then the second question we want to know about is, are there differences between placentas from mothers who gave birth to males versus female infants? The function top table is how we actually extract things like p-values, coefficients, et cetera, from that fit function before. And it has all these different functions for filtering out whatever you want to look at. So first, we have our contrast fit here, the COEF function, part of the function tells you what reference group you're, uh, what comparison you're talking about. If you remember in our contrast matrix all the way up here, we have this term EOPE group that looks at early onset preeclampsia versus term. So we're going to change this to term. And this adjustment method is the FDR correction, Benjamin E. Hochberg, which basically is a way for adjusting for the fact that we're testing 400,000 different things. So when you test a bunch of different hypotheses all at once, the chances that any one of them is going to be true um, compounds with each additional test. And this just accounts for that. And then we have our threshold of 0.05, what we're going to call significant. 
in a log fold change difference um, that we're going to um, take into account as well. So we have, oh, we have our 190,000 probes that meet that criteria. You can see these are their beta values, functions, going to return the average expression, in this case, the average m value across that, and also the log fold change in one group versus the other. And then I'm going to have one for, oh, we're going to have one for sex as well. Let's see what they have in that. And there are going to be far less probes associated with sex. And you can see, again, we have the same stats output, except this time talking about our comparison between male and female subjects. And I'm plotting this. A typical way is a volcano plot. I have all of this code here, but basically we'll just say is we'll label which probes are greater or less and then assign a different color to them. And then um, plotting this out for each of our comparisons, you can see oof, this should be term. One of the big results that will come out of differential methylation analyses, which is all subjects plotted versus your thresholds with the significant um, lead differentially methylated sites labeled as such. And yeah, so I have both of these here. You can try it with the different contrasts. And uh, a little take home that I have is if you want to compare this with any other, mm -hmm. um, any other of the comparisons in that contrast matrix, you can, you can go ahead and do that. Okay, so that's, that's our tutorial. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone have any questions? I'm sure that you have some questions because we kind of rushed through a lot of this. Um, we'll be here. We'll also be here for the, um, for the, uh, what are we calling it? It's like a session after. Oh, help session. Yeah, the open help session uh, later today. Andrew had a question. He wanted to know if there was any reason why that looks different from the conventional V shape. So that last plot you showed, and is that X limit or the X limit bounded? Yeah. So he says, "Never mind your Y axis is the best of P by P by." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why. Um, let's change that. Some people also plot beta value differences on the x-axis. Yeah, that's what I Instead of value. Yeah, there are all sorts of ways to um, change this. Let's see, we can make this. Um, mostly because the default limo plot doesn't let you like access coloring very well. Um, let's see, if we make this p dot, let's see what it's called in limo. P dot value. This should be more so what you're used to seeing. Oof. Yeah. Very wide. And the reason it's very wide is because we cut off the limits here, which you can also change. Can you maybe talk to uh, considering probes in regional groups? Yeah. Like, uh, 
differentially methylated regions as opposed to individual entities is each individual CPG really is not completely independent. Stats that are used are always fully independent. So, do you ever, I mean, could you talk to the difference between a fully dependent CPG analysis and like a differential methylated region analysis? Yeah. So, the approach to doing differential methylated regions analysis will usually first take into take a differential methylation analysis like this, and then we'll average across probes that appear to be varying together. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. the first- Regardless of like regional- No, depending on regional. Oh, okay. Yeah, so what they'll do is they'll look at probes in succession to one another, mm -hmm. and then they'll use like, are you familiar with like Bump Hunter or like, basically they'll, they'll be looking at a curve of effects of each probe, in order on each chromosome, and they'll be looking for where they vary together. And what they're basically just calling is, is this hump bigger than, than the baseline hump of effects across the genome. Um, there are a lot of ways to go about treating probes together. So differentially methylated regions will be with respect to a certain variable. There's also variably methylated region analysis, which is just looking for these first the set of probes that tend to be varying together. So it won't run this linear model first. It'll just look at probes in order by position and then see whether or not they all tend to be high or low um, at the same time across subjects. Um, one thing that's um, a little bit weird about differentially methylated region analysis is that you can end up with a situation where um, you'll call a region that's differentially methylated, but none of the individual probes in there will have like a super strong effect. And that's because they might all have a slight effect that's not marginally significant mm -hmm. for each of the individual probes. But when you consider them together, yeah, it's, it's hard to ignore that all of them are very in the same direction with the same um, variable of interest. Um, so yeah, um, annotating these differences to things like gene regions, etc., starts to become a little bit weirder when you talk about differentially methylated regions versus independent probes. So like the manifest that Illumina publishes. Um, I believe they they say that there are probes that are targeting a certain gene. Um, a lot of the time, it's it's more or less based on whether or not that probe overlaps, like yeah. UCSC's gene annotation. Mm -hmm. um, there are different ways of going about that, actually, right? Mm -hmm. um, that I haven't explored, but if you're interested in that conversation, I'm sure I'm sure Amy has thought about it a little bit more deeply than I have. Yeah. Are there any more slides in your deck, or is that? Yeah, oh, well, I guess we'd like to acknowledge our labs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from Jessica Dennis's lab. Um, a lot of the materials came from Wendy Robinson's lab, which Wendy is, is, um, mm -hmm. is Amy's supervisor. Yeah. Um, and also Sam Schaffner helped put together this tutorial a while ago when it was first created around two years ago. And I'm um, also like to thank Dr. Philip Richman um, for helping us organize here and also starting our group the trainee omics group mm -hmm. way back at BC Children's. Um, we're still running. We have our own Twitter page. We have our own Slack group. Um, if you're interested in joining, just email us at tog, T O G, at bcchr.ca. Mm -hmm. So we'll bring this recording to a close.